welcome you to the opening session of the Federated Launch Conference. We've already been going here for two days uh, for workshop, but this is the beginning of Block A. I'm Moshe Vardy, I'm the general chair. This kind of assembly reminds me a story about John Kennedy who once invited all uh, US Nobel Prize winners to a dinner in the White House. And when they all sat around the table, he said, this is the greatest assembly of IQ in the White House. Since Thomas Jefferson used to dine here alone. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a great assembly of, uh, of logic intellect here. Uh, the Federal Logic Conference has been going on since 1996. It's been kind of quite amazing. It's getting bigger and bigger, and we're now probably going to be around 2,000 people running around here over the, over the past two days. In fact, the summer school started, uh, what, a week ago, and we're going to go on from, from here for another at, uh, at least 10 days. There is a, a long tradition of logic in Oxford. It goes back to the, probably the most famous logician of all time, the Reverend Charles Ludwig Dodson, probably famous mostly as Lewis Carroll, but uh, he was a, a don here in the 19th century. Then in the 20th century, um, Gehenig is a celebrated tradition, starting probably uh, the first one here, I think, was Christopher Strachey, came here in the mid-60s, in the, and then, unfortunately, died young in the mid-70s. But then Dana Scott joined him in 1972. Dana, you came in 1972 to Oxford? Correct. And this was the birth. We, we just had a workshop celebrating 50 years of, uh, of domain uh, theory. And then a few years later, and Dana was here for about a decade. And then uh, Tony Hawk came here a few years later in 1977 and was here for about 30 years. And we are very fortunate to have both of them here with us in the room. An event like that, as you can imagine, takes non-trivial financial resources to, to make it happen. And we are very grateful for our many, many sponsors who help us to make it happen. In particular, I would like to um, thank our platinum speakers that you see him here on the list, starting from the computer science department here, uh, VTCS, Huawei, Deep Blue, Amazon, ACM, the AI Journal, Google, and SEF and Facebook. All of them help us thank, thank them very much. <laughs> and last but not least, it takes a lot of uh, legwork to make something like that happen. And there was a very large local team that participated. And we all we owe them gratitude, in particular, <coughs> Marka Kwiatowska and Daniel Kroning did just a little work to make all of this happen. Let's thank them again. <laughs> so we're here for a, a fistful, with F-E-A, F -E -A, fistful of logic in the next uh, almost two weeks. And we're going to start with a, with a, with a plenary talk in Prakash. Prakash, 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 please come here. And this is going to introduce our opening speaker. <coughs> Undefined zero one. Okay, white words. Uh, <coughs> so uh, before we start, I'd like to make some housekeeping announcements. So first of all, as before all long flights, I'm supposed to remind you where the exits are. I don't think I have to tell you where, to, uh, where your seat belts until Pete gets going. So there is no fire drill planned for today. So if you hear the fire alarm, it's the real thing. And you have to uh, <coughs> follow the fire marshals and assemble outside the building. So please, no f uh, tea, food, or coffee in the room. Water is OK, but uh, no other substances. The toilets are at the back of the building. And timekeeping policy is private to me. OK, so <coughs> uh, the session is being recorded and photographed. So if you have objections to appearing in these things, please let us know, and we will uh, do something about it. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> OK, so let us begin. So it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce my old friend, Peter O'Hearn. I first met him during MFPS in 1988. And at that time, he was a PhD student doing his PhD under the supervision of Bob Tennant at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. <clears throat> Queen's was just starting its PhD program at the time, and amongst its faculty there was some apprehension as to 
whether the semantic stuff was real, mainstream computer science. But uh, eventually, we got, we got past that. Uh, <clears throat> and he was awarded his degree. Even then, I was struck by how ambitious he was. He told me he wanted to solve the full abstraction problem. He wanted to give a semantic account of relational parametricity. And I thought, oh my god, this boy needs some reality testing. <coughs> Uh, and I gave him all kinds of advice about how to be cautious. Fortunately, he ignored all that and did those things. <clears throat> so he is known for both these topics, uh, but also for subsequent work. So he did some very fine work with David Pym on the logic of bunched implications. And later on, a lot of work with uh, John Reynolds, Steve Brooks, and a cast of thousands in East London on uh, <clears throat> separation logic and concurrent separation logic. So both Steve and Pete were awarded the Gödel Prize in 2016 for their work in concurrent separation logic. He, <coughs> he won many awards. I'll tell you about a few of them in a minute. But most notably, he founded a company which was subsequently bought by Facebook. And he has brought real uh, <coughs> the far out ideas of theory to the real world of software engineering. So that's the thing we're really celebrating here. Um, so he was awarded the CAV Award also in 2016 for separation logic, along with John Reynolds and the uh, cast of thousands that I mentioned before. This year, he was awarded an honorary degree from his former undergraduate institution, Dalhousie University, and he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. So let's uh, congratulate Pete for all these things. <laughs> Take it off, Pete. <clears throat> Great. So it's a, I mean, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here, and especially to be introduced by Prakash, who was one of my teachers who taught me concurrency theory at Queen's many years ago. And Prakash, a little bit of concurrency will come up during this talk. <laughs> and I, have, I warn him, don't worry, I won't quiz you on the questions <laughs> like you did me back then. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about our experience with a program reasoning or program analysis tool inside of Facebook. Now, it's just almost five years ago that our company was acquired by Facebook. Um, that will be next Wednesday, will be five years since this was announced. So I've been embedded in the company for five years. Um, and I have a background as a theoretical computer scientist. I think I still am a theoretical computer scientist. But going into the company, I took very seriously um, the idea to pay careful attention to the engineering goals. So the engineering goal inside the company, the job of our team, was to help Facebook's engineers, who themselves were writing product code <coughs> to serve, well, the billions of people using their products. So our job is to help the engineers do their jobs. Our job is not necessarily to create novel technical contributions. So helping people is the goal as an engineer, higher than novel technical contributions. But we have to make novel te te technical contributions sometimes because the problems are so hard. But my focus in this talk is not a bunch of technical contributions that we've done, but rather some observations that I've made over those five years um, of problems which, if we can solve those problems, can help formal reasoning, or so I believe, to help more people. Um, this has been my career goal, really, is to have formal reasoning help more and more programmers around the world. Um, so I'm going to, by the end of the talk, I'm going to mention some open challenges. Um, before then, I'm going to give some of the experience we've had on, along the way. So to begin with, continuous reasoning. So it's best described by um, opposition to one thing. So there's the waterfall model of software development. Now this is a straw man proposal, the waterfall model. I don't think anybody ever believed it, even when it was first described. So you first make the requirements, then the specification, then the design, then the code, then you're finished. I guess you celebrate at that point. Um, software has always been developed in a more iterative fashion. Even, so it's always been developed in a more iterative fashion. Now, we could posit a waterfall formal methods model. You start with a spec, you write the program, and then you check that the program's correct. Or we could even posit a rev what I'd call the reversing falls, water, reversing falls model. You start with the code. You run a program analyzer over the code. It generates a list of bugs. 
you hope that there aren't too many false positives and then you're done. Now, I wouldn't, I'm not criticizing any individuals for holding these straw man positions, except for perhaps myself. So when we first went into Facebook, the first deployment of our analyzer was this batch mode deployment. So what we would do is we would run the analyzer overnight, it would produce a list of bugs, and then we would assign the bugs to developers. And a funny thing happened. I worked really hard to get the false positive rate down before we shipped this analyzer to the developers in this mode. And then it was very difficult to get the, the developers to pay attention. They didn't fix hardly any of the bugs. Even though it was, so I thought, a low false positive rate, the fix rate was near zero. So this was really an eye-opener to me. Um, now, what was going wrong is that the way we presented the bugs to the developers wasn't in their workflow. It didn't fit with how they developed software. Software has developed more and more in an iterative or continuous fashion. And there's automated support for this these days. So there's something called a CI system, and, um, a continuous integration system. What, the conti what happens is the developers, maybe many developers, will share a code base and they'll be checking code into the code base. Um, the continuous integration system will make sure that the code at least builds or passes certain tests when it's in flight. Code reviewers are involved in the process and then eventually code gets to product. Now, our second deployment followed this model more. And our second deployment is what I would call the continuous diff time deployment. So there, there's the developer and there's the CI system. Now, attached to the CI system is infer, our program analyzer. So every time the programmer submits a modification, um, a modification to the code, a version of infer is uh, sparked up in the continuous integration system running in the data center. It automatically comments on the code I at the same time that code review, so code reviewers are interacting. I'm sorry, this isn't working so well. There. Code reviewers are interacting with the developer, making comments. The program analyzer acts as a bot in this process, and it also makes comments at the same time. So. What this does is it solves two problems that the batch mode deployment doesn't. Um, first of all, if you find a bug in the code mod, it's highly likely that that bug is relevant to the developer. In the batch mode, when you find a bug, it's hard to figure out which developer to give the bug to. That's the relevance problem. There's another even, even perhaps even more important problem, the human cost of context switch problem. So you know when you're proving a theorem, and somebody says, um, would you do something different? Would you mark an exam? Would you prove another theorem? You have to swap out the mental context, swap that one back in. And then it's hard to swap that mental context back in later for your proof, right? Um, this is the problem with the batch mode deployment. Um, the mental cost of context switch is huge. And so this is, is what the Facebook engineers explained to me led to the low fix rate of the other deployment. Um, so working continuously, making the program analyzer work continuously um, in tune with the developer workflow makes a huge difference. Um, so I'm talking about here on this spectrum is diff time. There's a whole spectrum of when you can present um, issues to the programmers. So the more traditional way of thinking, what I call the reversing falls model, is further, further to the right. It would be good if we could push as much stuff to the left as possible. Um, and so this example I've given so far is at diff time. We, it would all be also be good to push as much reasoning as possible to build time or to IDE time. But I'm going to concentrate on diff time in this, in this talk. So the stark lesson that we had is that batch mode deployment saw at that time near 0% fix rate. Diff time continuous deployment saw a 70% fix rate on the issues we gave to the developers. This stunned me. I mean, I always knew that presenting the issues to the developers earlier would be good, but I wasn't at all prepared for this stark of a difference. And the consequence of this now is that inside Facebook, not just the infer tool, testing tools, um, as well as other static reasoning tools, we're pushing it as much as possible to diff time instead of later because of this um, stark difference that we see. Um, 
So, I'm, I mentioned, I'm not claiming these kinds of, these are general points, I'm not claiming them as novel points. It's even more, more powerful for me than novelty is corroboration. When other people find similar things. Because then you can feel that it's even more powerful conclusion you can draw from that. So, um, Coverity has observed similar problems with the batch deployment. There was a talk by their CEO in Popple 2014. Um, they, di they didn't do the diff time continuous deployment in response, but similar problems observed by Coverity. Similar problems observed by Google. There's um, a, a CACM paper this year which says code review is a sweet spot, and they um, give static analysis warnings in code review in a similar way to infer. They came the, to the same conclusion independently. Um, they, even, they also have a statement, bug dashboards are not the answer. So they're opposed to the reversing false model that I described earlier. Um, corroboration number three, there's Amazon, <coughs> work at Amazon. So here's a nice quote from a CAV paper that continuous checking to ensure that the properties remain proven during the lifetime of the software. And an interesting thing about the Amazon work is how far removed in a way it is from the Facebook experience. So the Facebook experience, we're doing completely automatic program analysis. Um, so I'll say, we've got large code recovering, but the theorem is small. Does the code crash, is the theorem. Um, Amazon ha is covering small code, but very large theorems. So they're trying to describe the correctness properties of, of, of security software. So um, Byron Cook is, Byron, I'm pleased to see Byron here today. He'll be giving a talk, and there's other talks related to this next week in CAV. Um, there's a tremendous amount of space to play around in, in here. And what I'm going to concentrate in this talk, though, is the infer experience, which is the big code. OK. Now, it would, you could think that what I've described about the continuous reasoning model, it's merely how to hook up to a system. It's merely, we've got the bug list. How do I present it? It's just as easy as that. But it's not quite as easy as that. And the reason is, because there's this little issue of scale. So these are numbers in the kinds of codes we're dealing with at Facebook from 2015, so it's considerably bigger now. What we have to deal with, our program analyzer has to deal with tens of millions of lines of code, hundreds of, thou hundreds of thousands of code changes per week. So you can see a long-running analysis is going to have great difficulty with that. So it's not merely a matter of hooking up to the, to the code review system. We need to somehow get a handle with this much code that's changing that quickly. Um, my way of doing that, and I'm so pleased to see Dana here, um, my w the, the way I came across, the idea I came had for doing this was that we were doing a whole program analysis back in 2008, and it was scaling to 10,000 lines of code. And one of my colleagues, Calcano, said, what's the main thing in the way of scaling to big code, many millions of lines. And I said, we need a compositional analysis. Luckily, I was trained in the notational semantics. And the intuitive argument for why compositional analysis scales has to do with the independence of the parts. So, so I can take the meaning of the different parts independently of one another. So suppose in an abstract semantics, in the sense of CUSO, where I'm going to compute these things, um, suppose I had a bound on how much time would it take each of the MI? And suppose F, the means of combining, wasn't too, um, <coughs> wasn't too complicated. Then I would scale linearly. So I'm, I'm skating over a few things here and, and painting with a broad brush. But compositional analysis gets you in a, a state <coughs> where you can start thinking about scaling linearly with large code bases. And furthermore, it gives you a way to make your analysis incremental. And so the, to make the analysis incremental, you need to, it, when you look at the change of an entire, you've got an entire code base, you see a small change, you would rather analyze only the small change rather than, in, than the entire code base. Um, so the discoveries we made for how to do this, it started with infer 1.0. So using separation logic, what we did is we calculated the meaning or the abstract meaning of a procedure was instead of like in denotational semantics, uh, infinite or very large set of input-output pairs, we tried to make it a small collection of pre-post specs in, in separation logic. 
Now, building on that, we moved on to infer 2.0 framework for compositional abstract interpreters. Let me just describe a little bit about the first one. So, like I said before, we were able to scale, we were able to, back before we did compositional analysis, we made an analysis that was running on 10,000 lines of code. And much more than this, it would time out. We switched to the compositional model, and it was able to prove somewhat less than the whole program analysis, but we were able to scale then to three million lines of code, and now it'll go into ten, tens of millions of lines of code. And this was the difference between being able to deploy the techniques at the Facebook scale and not being able to deploy them. Um, now, the, the key idea that the compositional analysis has, which lets you deal with code diffs, even when you've got a huge code base, is I call it begin anywhere. <laughs> so, because you can take the meaning of a term independently of its context, when you have a compositional program analysis, what you can do is start the analysis at any line in the code base. You don't have to start it at main. And so when the programmer submits a change to the code base, you can spark off the analysis on just that change. Now, there are further considerations of how much work you do after that change, but this gets you in the game of analyzing just the changes right away. And so this is the key thing, which, is, which enables to us to deal with all of those diffs going into the code base, the hundreds of thousands of diffs per week. This is how the compositional analysis lets us deal with that. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to dive into more details on one of our analyses. So the work on separation logic, it took a lot of innovations over many years, right? So I'm not going to describe that. What I'm going to describe instead is a more recent case where what we've done after the separation logic experience is we abstracted from what was going on in the tool and made a framework for compositional abstract interpreters, which could do many of the same things, but maybe didn't need that level of innovation. And so the consequence of that is now, after having abstracted from that experience, we're able to make reasoning tools much more quickly that can get some of the same benefits. And so I, I want to present that because that more strongly makes the point that compositionality is very powerful. Compositionality is very powerful. It's great, built on tops of lots of innovations in logic, but we can do much simpler things and still get a lot out of the analysis tool. So now I'm going to um, talk about this case study, and I'm going to make this a bit personal. So. This is what was happening. So I, I was the manager of the Infer team, and we were trying to make it succeed inside Facebook. And we did to some degree. So there was ten th tens of thousands of bugs fixed over a two-year period, and the team was succeeding. And then I was getting antsy. I said, I want to do some technical work. And I said to my manager, I need to do something challenging. And he said, well, what would you like to do? And I remembered I had said this to a fellow, Mike Hicks, who has the Programming Languages Enthusiast blog. I said, if I could work on something I, to make a difference. I'd like to work on concurrency analysis because I thought this is a hard open problem, concurrency analysis. Um, and so let me see. Produce high quality reports useful to programmers writing concurrent programs without disturbing their workflow too much. So concurrency analysis was a very difficult open problem to my way of thinking. Um, so just to remind you, there's lots of interleavings, right? We can come up with a few numbers which say, it will take a long time to explore the interleavings if we explore them all. And we can make these numbers bigger so you get more, than <coughs> more interleavings than the number of atoms in the universe, the estimated atoms, very quickly. Um, so there's lots of interleavings. And people have worked to have fewer interleavings, explore fewer interleavings. But still, program analysis for concurrency at that point, as far as I knew, hadn't helped the working programmers too much. So um, I decided to have a go. And these are the kinds of slogans we find on the Facebook office walls. My manager said, um, why don't you have a go at that problem? And you know what? If you fail, that's okay. We'll, we'll learn from it. So I decided I was a manager. So then I started moving back towards an engineering or scientist role at the start of 2016 to tackle this problem. Um, and so what I did then from this period, February to June of 2016, so I had an end to this problem where I thought, 
we've developed concurrent separation logic. Why don't I make a program analysis based on concurrent separation logic? And then I'm going to, I thought I could see how to make it scale. And we're going to prove hundreds or thousands of classes in Java thread safe. So I could see this plan. But that's quite an abstract plan. So when th that's a scientist's kind of plan. Now, as an engineer, what you do is we want to understand the engineering context. How is this actually going to help people? So I said, before embarking on that plan, what I did is I started reading lots and lots of code in the Facebook code bases. So I would scour the code. I would do mental proofs in concurrent separation logic. And I would try to figure a few things out. Um, and I found lots of interesting code. Um, here's one little bit of it. Um, you see the comment up there. This is written to by the main thread with the lock held, read from the main thread. On Android, there's something called the main thread, the main UI thread, with no lock held, or read from, or read from any other thread with the lock held. So what they're trying to do is to avoid too much synchronization in order to make the code run faster. So if I convert this into something more like concurrent separation logic, you see here I've got synchronized <coughs> lock. That's the critical section. Then I read from X here without any protection. Here where I write to X, I need protection. But here I read from X, I have protection as well. You see, this is in the other thread. But because I'm in the same thread as the only write, I can safely read it here without any synchronization. They're saying something like that. So then I, um, we won't go into the details of this. What I did is I found, oh, there's a ne neat proof of this in concurrent separation logic using something called fractional permissions. So where there's a resource invariant describing the storage the, that a lock owns, and there's fractions associated with the L values, and the synchronized statement adds the fraction from the resource invariant. So here we ha have x has permission 1 half, which means I can read from it, but I can't write to it. Then inside the lock, I add that half to this half, and I get 1. Oh, now I can write to it. Then I subtract at the end, and I can still read from it. I still get a half. And this all works out as well. So there was a very nice proof using fractional permissions. I looked at lots and lots of code. And I determined that with CSL with fractional permissions, m almost everything that I'd seen in the Facebook code base, we could, we could reason about it very cleanly. Um, there was a few difficult cases, but almost all of it. Now, so that was, that was I started making a prototype tool. Then a really funny thing happened. Um, one of my colleagues put a note on one of the internal Facebook groups saying, Peter's working on this. He's working on concurrency analysis. And I had a timeline. I was going to ship this about a year from that point, because I thought it would take me a year to get my prover written. People working on um, Android in New York, Facebook for Android, they said, oh my god, we want this, and we want it now. And so then I said, oh my god, well, what am I going to do? It's going to dramatically help us in H1. But I had my plan. I was going to ship this in a year. And I said, no, we need to take the Android app. We need to make that multi-threaded so we can speed up the Android app. And speeding it up is always good, right? So they were going to do that, except that they were scared. They were converting a sequential program to a concurrent program, many, actually hundreds of thousands of lines. And this could introduce concurrency errors. So they were frightened. So they wanted this tool, which didn't exist. Um, so then I thought to myself, um, what should I do? As a scientist, maybe I say, listen, I'll just deliver you this tool in a year. If you can't use it, then too bad. But I'll have this very beautiful prover. Um, as an engineer, I should say, I thought, oh my goodness, this is like a golden opportunity for static analysis. Because usually with static analysis, you're trying to beg the programmers to, um, to, pay it, to heed the warnings and not waste their time. But here we've got a case where they're saying, please give me the static analysis. So then. Um, I, I took my scientist's hat and I put that to one side. And I, I became the engineer. And I said, we have to help these people now. And so what I did is I, I did something. I admit, I compromised, right? Um, <laughs> and, 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 and you know what made me feel OK to compromise? It's words of, um, of my great friend Tony Hoare, who's, who was, had been giving talks. And I took his words into Facebook with me. He said, um, Scientists are idealists. They, look f they go after purity of measurement, full program proof, ideals like this. Engineers, they need not to be idealists. They must compromise because of there are conflicting interests. 
I carried those words through me whenever I had to act as an engineer in, inside Facebook. And it calmed me down a lot because um, I was going to compromise. There was no way to help these engineers within, they needed this soon, within two to three months without compromising. So understanding the engineering context, part two, the people. So for this, what happened is I was working alone on the project. Then I drafted in a Facebook really uh, crack programmer, Sam Blackshear, to start coding faster than I could on this problem. And we met with the Android engineers in New York and we spec'd out, um, this is what in startup land they call an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. What's the minimum thing we can do to help the engineers? Make that, then iterate and make it better. This is a, t a very typical approach in engineering. To go for the MVP, not the, the minimum, not maximum viable product. So this was part of the specification they gave us. Um, let me mention in particular the high signal. When I told them that, that we couldn't make a race, pro a race prevention prover within two months, they said, no problem. Give us low false positives um, tool. Find a lot of races, but if you don't find them all, that's okay. Balancing false negatives and false positives is okay. And engineering I is like that in that they're not going for perfection, but if they have some things that they can measure and iterate and improve on, then they're very happy. So they're not looking for perfection from us, but they were looking for something pretty good. Um, then I had to make some design principles. And the design principles, probably if I wasn't a researcher, would have been difficult to come by because it came from years of experience and a lot of prejudice probably in me of things not to do, right? Um, so there's a lot of don't do's on this slide. So be compositional. That's because if you don't, if you do whole program analysis, you'll we'll never scale, will never help the programmers in, in, in that context. Um, sequentially, because we can't explore all the interleavings, concurrent separation logic gave us a lot of lessons for how we could get quite far with that. And this tool uses some of the spirit, if not the letter, of the concurrent separation logic. Um, go for some simple data races. Don't go for them all. Or in particular, don't attempt a general alias analysis. We can talk about later wh wh why that can get you into a lot of trouble. Um, the final thing is Occam's razor. Make it as simple as possible. Um, so sometimes when I talk about this to, to my scientist colleagues, it's, it's weird because when they see the techniques that are very simple, they're disappointed because it's not complicated or not, quotes, interesting, right? But of course, we, we, we would like things to be simple, but there's a very en en important engineering reason for making things simple. Um, we were going to make this tool and ship it to the engineers and then start iterating with it to make them better. We weren't following the waterfall model of making a program reasoning tool. We were following the iterative model. Now, if I'm iterating quickly with the engineers and my tool is too complicated, then I won't be able to keep, I won't be able to understand what's happening. So we adopt, adopted the principle that no innovations can go into this tool unless we have an extremely good reason for doing so. Um, so the, the design has, so each procedure denotes a summary and the summaries, so there we're, we're writing domain equations, see? We're doing um, almost like denotational semantics, but we're, we're making, uh, the summary is a four tuple, so it's got some information about locks, so it's the natural numbers because Java has what's called reentrant locks. So this is where you can lock more than once, the same thread can lock more than once. And first we had a Boolean model before, but we ended up with th this reentrant model because of some false positives. Um, then there's some information about threads. There's some information about accesses, access paths. These, these play the role of L values um, and, and ownership. And so ownership has to do with when I allocate a cell, freshly allocate it, nobody can race with it because I've freshly allocated it. Um, let, me, let me try this. Right, so here's, here's some code which is like I discussed before. So here I've got the synchronized this m count equals one. I'm on the main thread and I'm synchronized. Um, I'm re I read on the main thread and I'm not synchronized. 
there's no synchronization. I know that it's on the main thread. So actually it can't race with the first one. And then read off the main thread, it is synchronized, right? So all of these three together should be okay. Ah, please. Yes. Now, what happens, and this is, this is usually where I would, I would ask Prakash, uh, <laughs> and he might not get the right answer, but, I, but it's going to say, it's going to give a bad answer here. Um, what we've done is we've just keep, kept track of some information about threading and some information about synchronization and some information about accesses. So we can, in fact, report the read-write race in that case. So you see that we're recording just enough information in the summaries to make determinations like this. Um, so let me find another one. Here's another interesting one. So it's uh, for compromising time. So here's the pointer transferring buffer. This would have been one of the classic examples of concurrent separation logic. So here, what I do is I allocate in M0, I allocate a new thing A, new A. Then I transfer it to the other thread through synchronization, and I dereference it, trans the dot, dot data field, I dereference it in both threads. So this is a data race, yes? Um, and this is something that would have been the bread and butter of concurrent separation logic. And now if I can just do this perhaps properly. It doesn't find it. So you see, this is my compromise. This is a false negative. And the kind of thing that we did is we have our ownership model is such that once something's owned, we're not going to, in, in the beginning, it might become unowned later. We're not going to track that. We're just not going to report on newly allocated things. So that's one of the compromises we made. Um, so I can generate lots of false negatives, if I yeah, artificial false negatives. But um, so I can generate lots of false negatives. But we were running this analyzer in prod, and and it was working really well, and and I was a bit puzzled about this. So we started to do certain things. We started to try to change the analyzer to make it sound for bug, bug prevention, so to make it more principled, so to speak. And, and we tried this. We, we did an alias, uh, an escape analysis to track these kinds of problems with the pointer transferring buffer. Too many, f it could f find the bug, but too many false positives to put into production. We implemented an alias analysis to find some more bugs. Too many false positives to put into production. Then one day I said, is it 20 minutes? Then one day I said to myself, um, why don't we stop, we've got this already effective analyzer. Why don't we stop changing that to fit some preconceived notion and instead try to understand why that analyzer is effective. So I, um, I came up with the, th uh, the statement of a theorem, which I thought went some ways towards explaining why this analyzer was, was effective. And we call it the true positives theorem, which is that the analyzer reports no false positives under certain assumptions. The assumptions are that, that the, we only have non-deterministic choice for the Booleans, and there's no recursion. We can talk for a while for, uh, about this choice, about the assumptions. Um, it's refle it reflects somewhat what's going on in product code, but not infrastructure code. Infrastructure code, the non-deterministic choice bit in particular, would be quite bad. Because when you're implementing synchronization patterns, um, the, 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 the choices you make are, are important. But in product code, this isn't a for all, what I'm saying. The tendency in the product code is that if you're racing only dependent on one, of the, one or the other of, of choices, you still might want to know that. Um, there's nothing that perfectly captures um, um, product code, but these are the assumptions. And there's an under approximation. Ah, we can state this in abstract interpretation terms. This is an under approximation of an over approximation of an under approximation. So um, um, the first under approximation is no recursion. So, if there's recursion, just, just, just ignore any traces that involve recursion. Um, the over approximation is replace all Booleans by non-determinism. Then the final under approximation is no false positives. And so this is, um, 
I th so this is quite interesting in that we have the already effective analyzer. Um, there is a way, I think, to explain how this is. The fact that it's not sound for bug prevention doesn't mean that it's ad hoc. There is a way to say something about it. And this way of combining the under approximation and over approximation um, gives a good way to do that, I think. And I, I th I'm probably just agreeing with things. I'm sure Patrick Cuso has said similar things many times. Um, now, but there's another thing I'd like to say, which is quite interesting. This theorem didn't hold for the analyzer when I stated it, and it still doesn't hold. Um, there's a version two of the analyzer that it holds for, which is not in production. We're measuring how different it is, but it doesn't hold for the analyzer. So why am I talking about it? Well, although it didn't hold for the analyzer, whenever we changed our analyzer subsequent to discovering this theorem, we used this theorem as a guide. So we would make changes that were consistent with this theorem rather than against it. And this reminds me of something my PhD supervisor, Bob Tennant, told me very many years ago. He said, you can use semantics. Once a language is set in stone, you can use semantics to figure out what's true about the language. He said, a much more powerful use of semantics is to use it as a guide for language design while it's in flight. And the same is true for reasoning tools and program analyzers. So although the theorem is not true of the in-production analyzer, it has influenced the design of the in-production analyzer. So I just I th think Bob Tennant would, would like that. And I think I understand now much better what he was saying than w when he told me these things many years ago. OK, so this analyzer, it's quite simple. It's had quite a bit of impact, I think, compared to just Let's be honest, quite a bit of impact compared to other static analyses for concurrency. So there you have some of it. There's 2.5K race bugs. The bit about false negatives, which is very weird, is that we haven't observed any in prod production for over a year. Although I can generate the artificial false negatives, we haven't seen them come up. None have been reported to me. Some might have occurred, but they haven't been reported. And one of the Android engineers said, that in this project to take um, the Facebook Android app and make it multi-threaded, he said they wouldn't have tried it without the analyzer. So not only is it finding bugs, it's helping people write new code. Um, now the other thing that's neat about this is that it um, is that the the sometimes you give static analyzer hints to people that are about type issues or or, or advice. The engineers really appreciate concurrency warnings because it can get them in trouble. They say things like, this, this, these bugs are nasty and really hard to debug. So they're really, really happy about these bugs. Um, and just to give you an illustration, a bit of fun. Um, so sh shortly after this project, one of the people on it, Nikos, made an analyzer for detecting deadlocks and starvation. And he was able to do this qu quite quickly. This was in response to some deadlocks happening on the Android app. And the Facebook engineers are very happy about those two. So now whenever anybody fixes one of these bugs, starvation bugs, the in, the in the code review tool, we, they get a reward. Somebody will say, don't starve macro. So there's many macros floating around inside the system. And people make up when they find neat bugs to fix, they'll make up things like this. So the Facebook developers are having a great time with this. Um, and, and what I've just talked about is available in, in two papers. So there's the technical paper on RacerD, and then I have a paper uh, describing the experience of uh, developing the analyzer that I'm going to, that's at SAS 18. Now, an interesting point then, so that level of impact for concurrency analysis is it's quite fun. It's quite fun to do that, to, to make compositional semantics or abstract semantics, if you will, and then run it on millions of lines of code that affects some products used by billions of people and the engineers are happy with it. That's a lot of fun. So what makes this, let's step back for a second and wonder, wonder what makes these kinds of results possible? Well, the first point, tight feedback loop between the engineers and the scientists, or the engineers and the analysis experts, is very important for this. But one thing that I don't want to do is I don't want to, to sit here as, let's call me an industrialist now, saying 
the academics need to behave more like the industrialists. No, um, you don't need to work on industrial scale problems and it's very difficult for you to get this in this same kind of feedback loop. But what can we say? What can we say based on this kind of experience? What, what can I say to the scientists? Like, I don't want to say, be more like industrialists. Actually, we want in industry uh, the work from science on the fundamental problems that maybe we're not going to work on. Um, and there are fundamental problems which, if we could solve them, are going to make differences like this. And these fundamental problems have not to do with the number one here, the tight feedback loop. They have to do with the two other reasons that this, these results are possible. Compositionality at the bottom is from my technical analysis perspective. From the perspective of the users, it's the timely feedback, good feedback as well, but timely feedback, so moving fast. So what I would like to do then in the last few minutes is talk about in light of, of, of this experience, some challenges and opportunities for the field. Um, and now I'm going to quote Tony again. Tony and I were discussing this and he said what I wanted to say better than I did, so I'm just quoting him. Um, so there's, th there's this spectrum of when we can present issues to the, to the people. And Tony says, what we want is a range of tools with dif different response times from predictive tex texting in milliseconds to full functional correctness, maybe taking a month. Um, this is completely correct. I'm in full agreement with this. Um, but the tendency of work in program analysis field more, but also in program verification where the human rights specs is to be at the right end of the spectrum, is to, is to favor working on the months, it takes months for the program to run rather than takes milliseconds. And there's much less work over to the left. And yet as I've been explaining, I think left is where it's much easier to have a lot of impact. Um, and I don't actually know where to put all of the techniques that have been developed in the community, but I would like to push as many as I could to as far to the left as possible. Um, and then to quote another one of our friends here, um, Moshe, Moshe is here. Moshe, I call this Vardy's principle. The brainiac often loses to the speed demon. So it would be good for our community in developing reasoning tools to consult our inner speed demon. Now, let me turn this into s something approaching um, technical open problems. So I'll put this as the automatic compositionally, comp compositionality challenge. So we've got lots of really good techniques. Bounded model checking, counterexample guided abstraction refinement, concolic testing, fuzz testing, um, all of the wonderful numeric domains like polyhedra and things like that for proving, say, that there are no buffer overruns. All these, for the these, as far as I can tell, except for a few little cases, have been formulated in the running for days or months kind of scenario on large code. I don't see why they shouldn't be running quickly on the diffs like Facebook infers. I don't see why. I can't see how to do it myself. I don't see a blocker. And so the challenge is for any of these techniques, make the, the appropriate advances so that we could run them much more quickly at diff time. And if we could do that, then all of these, these very excellent techniques developed in the community, I think could have much more impact on the world. We could deploy them much more widely to much more code. Um, there's a theory challenge. Um, and this is very important to me. So there's abstract, there's some great things. So abstract interpretation is a great theory. But as far as scalable program analysis goes, um, we don't have great theories. So what we've been doing with the infer team is we've been charting one path through to get scalable analyses. Other people have charted paths through, but it feels more like art than science. The, the assumptions that we've got for making things work aren't really very clear. We're just finding some routes through. So what would be really great would be to have a general theory for constructing these sorts of analyses. It should explain existing examples. Um, these are my, some of my favorite things on this slide. There should be presumptions which show that you can have global and incremental scaling. And maybe to help us build program, to help us build these program ana analyzers, we could have an analysis of the concept of summary. So once again, Tony is, and colleagues are developing something called concurrent cleaning algebra, which is 
some algebraic view, which is very abstract, which would be a complement of abstract interpretation for some of the structure of concurrent programs. And something like this, I s sort of feel like, would be very useful to bring that kind, those kinds of ideas to bear in the general theory of program analysis. Now, I've just, I've j I've just made these points. These are some of my favorites. Um, I wouldn't mind if some, I would be delighted if somebody came along and said, I've got a general theory, but I'm not going to pay attention to what you've said here, Peter. I think uh, these other things are more important. That would be great for, me, great for me. So these are just some of the ideas that I had that listed as bullet points that might be useful. Um, so what I'd like to do then is these problems that, that I'm trying to, to show are quite important to me because I reckon that if advances can be made in these general directions, then formal reasoning can have more impact on the world, on companies and on people who use products everywhere. So what I would like to do about that is I feel strongly enough about it that hopefully this will work. No. <laughs> um, okay. Apparently, I'm not that good at this web at the web, <laughs> and I'm just going to have to say this. I think in words. Yes, I'm going to have to say this in words. <laughs> that didn't work out so well. So, um, what what we've got based on on the on the what I've been talking about today is that there's lots of problems that I don't know how to solve, and that. It would be great if, peop if some people in the scientific community were, were interested in, in tackling some of those. So I'm announcing that we're going to make some funding available for this called the Continuous Reasoning Research Award. There's going to be up to $50,000. There's going to be about five of them. And a research call should be on research.facebook.com anytime soon, <laughs> um, um, hopefully very soon. And there, there was another research call earlier called the Testing and Verification Award, which is complementary. The, the, the Continuous Reasoning Award is really about pushing things earlier on, the, on the, the, time, the bug time spectrum. That one is more general and it's about deployability, but they're complementary. So look for that information on the Facebook website. Um, hopefully by the end of today, we'll have that up there. Okay, thank you. <laughs>